So good afternoon. I am um, very pleased to be here at IGI to, to have an opportunity to have a conversation with you about some of the work that I'm doing and to learn about all the exciting things that are happening here at this institute. Um, my uh, meetings this morning really uh, were so enjoyable to just kind of hear both about uh, common interests that uh, the individuals here at the Institute have with regards to sickle cell disease, as well as some of the exciting things and the ways you're pushing forward uh, this issue of translation of gene editing into clinical care. So I want to have a conversation um, that's focused on this frame about the searching for a cure and gene editing and sickle cell disease. Um, what I will do is I'm going to just take a minute and talk about what I describe as the 110-year legacy of this disease and, and why this legacy is important as you do your research as, as researchers here um, to understand that history and to put your research in context of that history and the potential future uh, related to this disease. Uh, and then frame around um, the gene editing horizon that actually you can give that talk probably much better than I can, um, but for us to talk about this issue of gene editing on the horizon. Uh, but then I want to really spend my time um, with you th this afternoon to talk about issues with regards to fairness and respect and transnational cooperation related to gene editing and identify three areas that I think are important for that conversation. So sickle cell disease, as probably everybody in this room knows, uh, is a disease of the blood, a blood disorder disease of a single change and mutation of the beta, beta globin gene. Um, but the complications that arise from this disease are really varied based on an individual. And I think that's an important context to understand about this disease. If you've seen one individual living with sickle cell disease, you've seen one individual living with sickle cell disease because the phenotypic variation of the disease is quite varied where some individuals have very severe problems and a very short life, and others live a much higher quality of life and have a much longer life. But some of the common phenotypic complications include strokes, leg ulcers, priapism, uh, as well as in organ damage that significantly impacts the life of individuals living with this disease. So recognizing the different genotypes with sickle cell disease and recognizing the very, very issue with regards to severity of the disease, I think is an important part of this conversation when we talk about curative genetic therapies like gene editing uh, and who is the appropriate individuals to actually participate in these clinical trials and the ultimate ability to have this treatment in clinical care. But to put this in history, we need to talk about the history of sickle cell disease. And so I like to start in 1910 uh, with Dr. James Herrick. Uh, but to take a minute and say, this is a disease that was known in Sub-Saharan Africa for hundreds of years before James Herrick. But in G James Herrick in Chicago, Illinois, was the first individual to identify and describe sickle cell disease. Jane, uh, James Herrick and his resident, uh, Ernest Irons uh, had an opportunity to care for a patient. And the patient's name was Walter Clement Noel. And Walter Clement Noel was a dental student in Chicago who went to Dr. Herrick for treatment. And at the time of going with pain episodes and with chronic uh, ability to, 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 to do his daily life and quality of his life was not good, but he was a dental student, and I want to highlight that. The first sickle cell disease identified individual was a dental student in Chicago when he was diagnosed. So it put some context to think about this disease and the history of this disease that in 1910, this young man from a Caribbean island from Grenada had sickle cell disease and had lived a long life was a dental student when it was first diagnosed. And to put that in context to think about this disease in our situation today in 2020, 
and looking for a cure. So the story of Walter Clement Noel is this. He came to dental school. He was identified by James Herrick. They took a blood smear and they identified these sickled cells under the blood smear. And two years later, uh, Dr. Herrick reported this case study. But Mr. Noel continued to be treated by Dr. Herrick and then returned to his island in Grenada and lived for a number of more years as a dentist on that island. So this story tells us a couple of things about this recognition of this disease and this, this history of this disease of both that the disease should not just be seen as a disease of individuals with severe complications that are not able to be educated, not be able to live a full life, and not be able to do things that they want, but also a disease with these complications that individuals have the resilience to continue to do things to make sure that they have a very high quality of life. So the story of Walter Clement Noel, uh, there's a number of papers that have been published about this, um, particularly by Dr. Todd Savitt, that I would encourage you, if you're interested in knowing the history and the beginning of sickle cell disease within the uh, European and American medical literature. So let's talk about the last 110 years and a couple things that happened. So 1949 is a major milestone when we talk about sickle cell disease and Linus Pauling. So that year, published in Science, was a, a commentary that stated that sickle cell disease was the first molecular disease. So Linus Pauling played a really major role with regards to our understanding of the molecular basis of sickle cell disease, but also was important regarding an ethical question. So a couple of years later, uh, our Nobel laureate, Linus Pauling, said that we should put a tattoo on the forehead of all individuals with sickle cell disease so that they would not marry someone and then ultimately have someone, uh, a child with the disease. So both he had this great scientific basic background and understanding of the molecular basis of the disease, but raised a really interesting ethical question. So how do we think about this? How do we explore this of this great scientist, but also had this ethical lapse that I would identify of related to sickle cell disease. So 1998, years after sickle cell disease was first identified, the first FDA approved drug for sickle cell disease was approved by the FDA, hydroxyurea. Hydroxyurea, as many of you may know, was actually a cancer treatment. Um, but it increased fetal hemoglobin of individuals living with the disease. And hydroxyurea has been the primary drug for sickle cell disease um, for the history of this disease and our recognition of this disease. It is currently used with starting with infants uh, through adulthood to increase fetal hemoglobin today. Um, but it continues not to be able to be a benefit to everyone, not everyone. Uh, actually has their fetal hemoglobin increased with the use of hydroxyurea, and it has various uh, complications that cause some individuals living with the disease not to want to use this treatment. So this third slide, I don't know if you can see because it's, the, the, the screen is not that great, uh, is a paper that was published by uh, Dr. Sophie Lanscron and Dr. Carlton Haywood in 2005. And it was a paper that reported the age and more related to mortality. And it identified at that time that the average age of mortality for a male was 43 and for a woman was 45. But it also showed in this uh, study that as the actual uh, level of life increased for children, the mortality rate was decreasing, meaning that people were um, dying at an earlier age with sickle cell disease. And that they focused this on really related to healthcare experiences that individuals were having and barriers with regards to access to quality healthcare. So this tension of as individuals grew older, they were actually dying because of barriers with regards to quality 
access to good care. Uh, and raise the question about how do we grapple with this issue with regards to actual health services as we also um, move forward for additional treatments. And then in 2009, uh, some major work with regards to bone marrow transplant were taking place in sickle cell disease and really the first curative therapies were being developed uh, with regards to bone marrow transplant. And then in 2017, I would argue there was a, a major shift that has occurred with this disease. So first in 2017, there was a, the second drug approved by the FDA uh, for use with sickle cell disease in Dari. And then in 2019, several things happened that I think have been a great um, milestone for the future of sickle cell disease. There were two new drugs that were approved by the FDA in 2019. But then in 2019, there was the announcement of the first case of gene editing, a CRISPR gene editing of an individual with sickle cell disease was announced in 2019. So we've gone through these last 110 years with regards to sickle cell disease, a disease that is a disease of discrimination of individuals going to the emergency room and being perceived to be drug seeking uh, and not getting appropriate care, a, a disease where it historically was not receiving the research support um, for the number of individuals with this rare genetic disease and a disease that has been racialized in the United States setting. And we now are here today in 2020 with sickle cell disease gene editing on the horizon. And the great work that's going on here at this institute and at other institutions across this country and across the world. So what does this mean? And how do we think about this with regards to the future of this disease? And what are some important issues for us to think about? So I just share with you a few articles that have come out in the last four years, including by some of the investigators in the room here today and, and work that's been done here uh, with the Epi Institute. Uh, but if you think about these articles and that all of these articles have come out in the last four years and where we are today with regards to sickle cell disease and the potential that we have going forward. And I think that's the setting that we have to look at. Uh, and as you know, um, there are really two major approaches that are currently focused on with regards to uh, gene editing and particularly focused on CRISPR gene editing. Uh, one is uh, modification of the BCL11A gene to increase fetal hemoglobin, and the other is to modify the beta globin gene to actually to modify the mutation. And the work that's happening here and happening at other institutions that are moving that work forward. So I want to tell you a little bit about some of the research that's going on in my uh, research group at the National Human Genome Research Institute. I'm an intramural researcher in our social and behavioral research uh, branch. Uh, and within that branch, uh, as was stated, I lead our health disparities unit. And I see sickle cell disease as a health disparity disease, a genetic disparity disease. Uh, and with the horizon of gene editing and other curative genetic therapies, I became really interested in wanting to have conversations with the actual community. I was at an American Society of Hematology meeting um, back in 2015, and it was very clear that this was on the horizon. Um, but all the conversation was about the science, and none of it was about um, what was the perspective potentially of communities with regards to this potential new treatment. Uh, and so I became very interested in wanting to move forward a project to actually listen to individuals in the community and get their views. So we spent 2017 and 2018 in the field collecting data uh, from adults living with sickle cell disease, from parents with a child with sickle cell disease, and from healthcare providers, all hematologists who care for individuals living with sickle cell disease. And we looked at that information to help share and inform what the perspectives were of the community with regards to the potential um, of these clinical trials coming to the clinic and a willingness of individuals to participate in these trials. 
So this was before the first uh, FDA approved clinical trial for gene editing was um, actually approved by the FDA for a CRISPR gene editing trial. So hopefully my work has helped to inform some of the efforts that are currently going on and hopefully the work that we're doing can also move forward to help as we continue down this road to develop these new treatments. So again, with this study, uh, we conducted 15 focus groups with um, adults living with disease, parents uh, of a child and their providers. Um, we used uh, some standard uh, measures uh, that had been used by um, the Pew uh, with regards to gene editing. Uh, and we wanted to share uh, our views of the sickle cell disease community with the general public and with the general public of African Americans to look at differences. We conducted three pilot uh, uh, focus groups to help modify our instrument and our survey guide, uh, as well as our focus group guide. Uh, and then we uh, uh, launched our study to go into the community uh, and to gather this information. And now we've done uh, various analyses of this work uh, and have published two papers and have a third paper that hopefully will be published soon uh, from that work. So I wanna share with you some of the voices from the individuals that participated in our focus group study and to kind of put a frame with regards to why I think your work is so important, um, but also that we must uh, struggle with um, what I argue are some important ethical and social questions with regards to the integration of gene editing into clinical care. So let me just start with what I would say is the take home message from our study. The take home message was that there was overall great optimism about the potential of gene editing and other curative genetic therapies for sickle cell disease. And so a couple quotes. It's exciting. It's what I've been waiting for one patient said. Another said, I'm very optimistic. It's another possible option for sickle cell patients. And unfortunately, we don't have many. So this was the message that I wanna share with you today, that this community recognizing the 110 year legacy of discrimination, of racism, of lack of quality care, is optimistic about the potential of gene editing and other curative therapies for sickle cell disease. That is the take home message of, from our study and the work that we've conducted. But you must put that in context with regards to the broader issues of how do we actually do this? How we actually integrate this treatment into clinical care? So in 2017, the National Academies of Science um, published a report on human genome editing which I actually think they did a really great job. Uh, and uh, I think that this is gonna actually be a foundation with regards to the principles that we should be having a conversation as we go forward. Because I think that the principles that they laid out, which are the seven principles that they think are important for human genome editing, are going to be important part of our conversation as we move forward the research and move forward the clinical care. So promoting well-being, transparency, due care, responsible science, respect for person, fairness, and transnational cooperation. And I wanna just highlight a couple of those principles around some issues that I think that we're gonna have an obligation and a responsibility to struggle with. So the first one is related to this issue of providing quality information to individuals. And the question, how do we ensure disease communities have access to quality, accessible, and scientifically accurate information? I think this is a fundamental question that the field, the researchers, the clinicians, as well as the patient community are gonna to have to struggle with. And I think that there's some really exciting opportunities to collaborate on this question not just for sickle cell disease, but use sickle cell disease as a model for other diseases where gene editing uh, will be important. Because this question about how do you make sure people have information 
to make an informed decision is essential to this conversation. And I know this institute is um, funding individual investigators and in thinking about this issue, is thinking about it as a broad education effort, um, but this question about informed information. So a couple quotes from our study. I'm not clear on how exactly it works. Is it something that they do in a thing and then they put it into your body? How does that work? Do they inject it in your bone marrow, in your blood? How does the CRISPR get on your DNA chain to make the changes, one adult said. So this question about how does this actually work to help me make a decision whether this is something that's of interest to me? What does it actually do for them on a daily basis? Will they have less pain? Will it halt like renal failure progression? Plus any complications, a physician said. As you see, this is a very well-educated group. And it's not that we don't understand or that we're resistant to research, but you need to explain in a way that people will understand, also be a credible source, one individual said. So this message of having high quality scientific information is essential for this community to help make decisions whether this is a treatment that they're interested in. And without that information, that lack of that information, I argue that that is an ethical lapse on the part of the scientific community. I want every risk associated with it, like even if it didn't happen, I want the theoretical risk and what might happen, what may happen, one adult with sickle cell disease said. So this question of understanding the risks, the benefits, the chances that something will go wrong that potentially could cause harm to that individual or to that individual's child. So what do people do when they want information? They type into Google whatever they're looking for, right? It's one of the first things we all do. And we go and we find what's on the web. So my group, my research group at the National Human Genome Research Institute is actually looking at what is currently on the internet about sickle cell disease and gene therapy and gene editing. Okay, so we're looking broadly at all curative genetic therapies for sickle cell disease to study actually the quality and the accessibility of the information that's on the web. So we're conducting a study by looking at what's on the web uh, and then providing an assessment of that material. We are not including um, things that are podcasts or news stories about individual patients uh, or news articles about individual patients, but we are including anything that would be described using the criteria that we developed as patient education materials. So we're particularly focused on this question of if I'm a patient or if I'm a parent and I'm looking for information to help me better understand this protocol, this treatment, this science, what would I find on the web? So when we find these materials on the web, we are using an ARC, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality assessment tool called the Patient Education Materials Assessment Tool, or PMAT, to actually to score each of these individual um, documents that we find on the web. So we're going through in a standardized way with two reviewers taking each document independently and coding and scoring um, the the document and then comparing their, their findings and then having a third person, if they disagreed, make a final judgment with regards to the quality of the material following this ARC guideline. So we're looking at understandability. We're looking at actionability. What action can you take related to the information? We're looking at scientific accuracy, uh, presentation of risk and benefits. And we're looking at readability and we're using tool tools 
uh, the flesh Kincaid grade level and the uh, smog uh, to assess these tools. Okay, so we are now in the process of doing this work. Uh, you may have seen some of these websites before that are included. Uh, we tried to identify all of the tools and then we had a librarian, a medical librarian separate from us uh, to go through to identify tools on the web. So we had an independent person also go through to identify the tools that we were able to find. And so this is an ongoing project in my research group. But the message that I want to share with you is there's uh, very few tools online uh, and the quality is variable with regards to the tools that are there. And I argue that we are at a time now where we really need as a community to come together to make sure that there's very high quality information on the web that's accessible to patients and parents and providers that can help them in being informed. So this is before getting to the stage of a clinical trial to be informed about the science and the risk and the benefits and the questions that they need to ask when they are talking to their physician or a researcher about a clinical trial. So the second area that I want to talk about is respect for a person, the principle of respect for a person. And I think that the, this is a real time um, issue that I think we all need to be thinking about uh, related to the excitement of these new therapies. And the issue is the story of the individuals who are first in humans who are participating in these clinical trials. So the principle of respect for first in human clinical trial participants. And I think this is another area that we as researchers have an obligation to be protective of individuals who are first in human clinical trials. So this is a quote from the Belmont Report that I think is timely with regards to this question. Persons are treated in an ethical manner, not only by respecting their decision and protecting them from harm, but also making efforts to secure their well-being. So think about that, the well-being of an individual. So this is not a health risk. This is an issue of thinking about someone and their well-being and how the story of their participation as a first in human participant can have an impact on their well-being. So I just use a couple examples here of stories that we've all seen over the last year. And these are stories that are exciting stories. They're exciting stories of individuals who have had great positive outcomes to date. But think about what could go wrong. Think about um, what this could mean with regards to discrimination, what this could mean with regards to misinformation, what this can mean um, to them to their families? And how do we think about this from a well-being perspective? Uh, I became really interested in this because I had several reporters over this last year call me at several times throughout the year to ask me to respond to a story that they were about to publish uh, and to talk about a participant in a trial. And I would always say, no, I can't talk. I'm happy to talk to you, but I can't talk about an individual in a trial. One, I don't know this individual. Two, I'm not part of that trial. But is that right? And so I think we have to um, struggle as we move forward with our enthusiasm about the science to be protective of individuals who are leading the front edge of moving this science into clinical care. And what do we do with regards to how we deal with identity and privacy and protection of the individual and the well-being 
of an individual who has participated in one of these studies have basically made a commitment to be part of research and made a commitment to help lead the science forward on how do we protect their well being. So, this is an article that I would encourage to all of you who have an interest in this area that just recently came out in the Hastings Center report by author Frank. And his, his article is not focused on the media and the stories, but it's really focused much more on narrative medicine and, and issues that we need to be thinking about. But I think it applies directly to this issue that I'm raising here and this issue of privilege. In the briefest terms, we need to understand how to tell respectful stories in which the characters are fully acknowledged fellow participants, not one dimensional object of a knowing gaze. The problem is narration itself. The problem is particular version of narrational privilege. And I think we have an obligation in our work to be careful and thoughtful uh, with regards to not putting individual study participants in a place where they perceive to have um, their privilege, their privilege taken away. Uh, and his article talks about people need to tell stories about other people. People tell multiple kinds of stories in different listeners or readers in different media. How people feel injured or usurped or diminished by stories told about themselves is a complex issue. And if people are put at risk by having stories told about them, they can also gain comfort from having their stories told. So I'm not saying that we should not have um, media part of this discourse about the excitement and what is happening in this research, but that we be very careful and very thoughtful of how we tell someone else's story. So how do we ethically engage the public and share this science while also respecting the first in human participants? So the last area I wanna focus on is with regards to global justice and equity in curative therapies. And I too here think that the Academy's got it right. Uh, and I think that there's two principles that are clearly um, highlighted here. One is fairness and transnational cooperation. And I think this is where there is both exciting work going on, but I think where we all need to be humbled as we think about a disease where the burden of the disease is not in the United States, it's not in Italy, it's not in Canada, it's not in Belgium, it's not where these trials are going on. It's in Sub-Saharan Africa, and India. That is where the burden of this disease is. And that we must always recognize that as we move forward our work and our research to recognize that the burden of individuals that are living with sickle cell disease is not here. And how do we hope and help and guide our work to actually make an impact in these areas of the world where millions of people are living with this disease versus 100,000. And how do we do that in a way that is both cost effective and appropriate, but is accessible to individuals uh, that live in these countries that are far away from San Francisco and Berkeley, California. So there are exciting things happening in this area, as many of you know. Uh, the Institutes of Health with the Gates Foundation are collaborating on a new major initiative to actually focus on new approaches that will hopefully reach more individuals and that will be accessible to more individuals with regards to gene editing and curative therapies. And I am really excited to see this work. I'm excited to have the conversation this morning about the things that are happening here to help to move that work forward. Uh, but I think we also must just be very humble about the potential of this and how do we actually recognize that this type of a treatment uh, is not available today, but
But today, also what's not available is the standard of care for sickle cell disease. So when we think about the standard of care today is to start uh, a child out on penicillin, uh, making sure that individuals have the appropriate vaccinations, uh, to put people in hydroxyurea, and that the vast majority of individuals living in Sub-Sahara Africa and India do not have access to these treatments today. And as we think about how we move forward to actually have curative genetic therapies, that we also must be thinking about how do we actually expand access to standard of care today uh, so that we can move forward. So I wanna share with you another project that my group is starting, and that's a project that we're doing in Sub-Sahara Africa uh, in the context where uh, approximately half of individuals don't live to age of five with sickle cell disease. The vast majority of individuals don't live to be adults, um, but that there are still millions of individuals who do reach uh, adulthood with sickle cell disease. So my group um, at the National Human Genome Research Institute is starting a collaboration in Sierra Leone. And Sierra Leone, which is in West Africa, is one of the poorest countries in Africa. Uh, it was affected by Ebola. Uh, and it had a major war that occurred uh, in that country uh, for a number of years. But it also has a very high uh, prevalence level of sickle cell disease. So it, collaborators in Sierra Leone, uh, as well as uh, investigators here in the United States from Sierra Leone, we are starting a project to actually take a study to Sierra Leone around sickle cell disease in adulthood to study individuals, to actually to, to increase um, the number of individuals who are getting newborn screening in Sierra Leone, uh, and to think about these questions of curative therapies in a country like Sierra Leone. So we're really excited to be doing this work, to think both about the ethical questions and the social questions, but also what is the current state of treatment in Sierra Leone today, and how can we help increase that quality of treatment and conduct research in that setting? So how do we ensure that these new technologies are available to even the most low resource or disadvantaged populations? And how do we bring current standard of care to low resource and disadvantaged populations? So I wanna frame this talk and frame this issue around true fairness. What does that mean, fairness, and how do we explore that? And how do we explore this principle with regards to the exciting things that are happening within the field of gene editing and sickle cell disease? And can we, as we move forward, the technology and the development of new treatments, think about the context of the principle of fairness? So I have two last quotes that I wanna share with you. To have the sickle cell population move this forward and then not have available for them equally would be extremely traumatic to the community, one physician said. I would say, don't mess it up. If you are one really talking about it impacting the sickle cell population, you have to be very careful that the other rare diseases that have more resources don't take it over and the sickle cell population gets left in the dust. Because they've been left in the dust with so many other things that they're already are skeptics, a physician said. So this question of fairness is an area that we must explore and in our conversation, our question and answers today, I would like to really talk about fairness. But before I do that, I have to acknowledge my research group. So these are the researchers, the folks that work with me in my research group at the Genome Institute. Uh, and um, I wanna highlight, I always do this now while I'm out on the road, training opportunities at the National Human Genome Research Institute. Um, I am hiring a postdoc to come and to think about these social and ethical uh, questions related to gene editing and sickle cell disease. If you're interested, let me know. Reach out to our website. Um, we're looking for individuals 
um, who want to come and spend a couple of years in Bethesda uh, struggling with some of these issues, as well as I'm looking for postbacks uh, who are also interested in these issues that I always bring to my lab. So with that, I would like to say thank you and that I uh, look forward to our conversation. tradition of asking for the, the first questions from uh, students or retreating. Uh, thank you, very exciting talk. Mm -hmm. um, you had this quote of an individual who wanted to know about all the practical aspects of this on And the story comes to mind a couple of years ago when the scientists at CERN um, shared the very clear theoretical risk of a black hole forming in the Large Hadron Collider. And that's basically everything everyone jumped on, right? Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, how would you want to effectively educate people about risks that are very low probability without having them develop fear of things that are very unlikely? Yeah. No, I think that's a great question. So I think that's why it's so important that we create um, really high quality information that's available for people uh, and that there's conversations so that people can debate what's actually at higher risk and lower risk with regards to going wrong, uh, as well as potential uh, impact on individuals' lives over their lifetime. Uh, and that, then that gets communicated. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's difficult is how do you take information where you're showing risk and the risks are very, very low, but it's important that you share that with individuals. But I think that you can do that in a way that you separate out those things that are higher risk uh, of potentially going wrong and still showing that they are too very rare that that would ever occur and those things that are really remote and that are unlikely to ever happen. Uh, and so it's, it's, this is not easy, but I think we can do this where we can create accessible information that can distinguish things that um, are higher risk that people just need to recognize as they make decisions and those things that are quite remote. But what I argue is if you know something is a potential risk, to hide it would be wrong. And so we don't want to do that from an ethical perspective, but we clearly don't want to... Um, create a uh, feeling of fear um, when um, the information, the data does not support that the chances of that risk occurring will happen. Hi, um, I have a question related to the studies uh, on the resources that are available yes. to patients. Um, so, as the lines between credible and incredible sources become increasingly blurred, I'm kind of wondering how uh, organizations like the National Institute of Health are altering their methods to educate the public. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a wealth of, of information out there, very credible information, debunking um, misinformation about vaccines, their effectiveness, and their, their safety, but that hasn't done anything to stop the um, the anti-vaxxer movement. Um, so I guess, do you worry about excluding things like blog posts, Twitter, in these analysis of what's available to people? How, how is the government going about it? Yeah, so this is my research. This is not the government doing this as a researcher, independent investigator in the social behavioral research branch. These are my research questions, so this is not the Institute's um, educational materials. That's the first comment I want to make. Um, so I think the challenge is you always have to kind of create a, a parameter around what you're doing. Uh, and we made a judgment that if you were a parent and you were trying to make a decision about this is something I want to learn more about for my potential for my child, that one of the first things you want is information that would be considered health educational information. And so that's why we decided that that was the scope of this. Not saying that the blogs or social media or other kind of information won't be of importance and the stories 
of individual participants will not be important. But if you're going to assess about the quality, the scientific accuracy and the quality, I think I argue you need to start there. Uh, and that information that has been created with an expectation that um, individual patients and their families would be looking at that information for information to help them understand the science. And so that's kind of how we made our decision. But I argue that we have to look more broadly and that we need to come up with more creative ways uh, to provide different avenues for people to get information. Uh, and that you know, various other approaches like videos, like um, podcasts will ultimately be extremely important. But if you, didn't, if you can't get those things that are articulated as patient health information correct, then I think we got a problem. And so that's where, why we focused on that. Thank you so much. That was really mm -hmm. great. Um, I think a lot of the people here at the IDI are super interested in these questions and this research. I'm about your point about, you know, physicians and patients really not wanting these new treatments to quote unquote screw it up. What do you think about the role of pharmaceutical uh, companies and insurance companies in ultimately being the people that are, or the groups that are going to screw this up? Because, um, <laughs> because I think that's the scary part about being an academic and thinking about these, you know, yeah. technology development, but then ultimately it's going to be inserted into the fabric of healthcare yeah. in this country for yeah. a horrible level. So I had some great conversations this morning that this institute thinks about the big picture. And I argue that researchers have an obligation to think about the big picture. And that um, it's not just the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies that could screw it up. I actually think the researchers can screw it up too. And I think that um, about everybody kind of coming together on certain efforts and then conducting that research to help develop models to actually uh, reduce the chance of things going wrong um, is an obligation for the researchers, just as is the obligation, I argue, for the pharmaceutical companies and for those individuals who are the investment bankers and everybody involved. If you really want to move this forward so it's integrated into clinical care, that we have to avoid um, some of the pitfalls that have happened historically. And I think sickle cell disease, um, you know, the potential is so exciting. And we, we can see the, this number of individuals that could be impacted, but we also know this legacy, right? And so we wanna make sure we don't repeat that legacy um, with regards to things happening that can either push back the science for 20 years or create um, another level of mistrust. Um, again, my take home message was the community is optimistic. They're hopeful. They're willing to participate in these trials. That was clearly the message I got. That's clearly the evidence that's being seen with regards to the trials that are currently um, open. So I think, I think this is a, a, a unique opportunity for everybody to work together in some ways to do some things to actually make money, to, to do great science, but to actually benefit people. And so, so I push it back on the researcher is how do you work with the government? How do you work with the pharmaceutical companies? How do you work with um, you know, the various groups that are at the table to help to move things forward in an ethical and appropriate way? Hey, thanks for the talk. Mm -hmm. um, so as you probably know by now, like equity and access is a pretty principal component of our mission here at the IGI. Right. And it's obviously particularly salient for sickle cell disease. So I'm curious, what would you say are kind of your key success factors in translating like, the intention to enact that both on the clinical side as well as the public engagement and actually executing that effectively? So I think that it's important to have these kind of dialogues that you're having and to bring people here and to have those conversations, but also go to people. So I think, you know, leave Berkeley and go out across the country and engage with people and having conversations and engage with the various 
um, stakeholders, industry stakeholders, also around these issues and government stakeholders. I think that's an important step. I also would think that one of the things is to listen um, and to listen to the various communities and their experiences and what's happening within those communities, what's working. Listen to the physicians that are caring for this, this patient population and what are the actual day-to-day -day barriers. You know, how will this work? You know, you know, will that parent be able to, to get that child to continue treatment or follow-up? Or will, will that adult be able to actually take off you know, for the number of weeks to participate in this kind of trial. How, how do we do this in a way um, that uh, is respectful? So I think you guys are just, everything I heard this morning about what's going on here just seems like, yes, you guys are getting it right. So now you got to share that with others if you're getting it right and, and, to, and to bring more people into your tent. I, I think that's really important. Um, so I was wondering, as you were talking about the principles of fairness, yes, um, and you were speaking about you know this technology being developed in the first world with the burden of the disease mostly being in third world. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think about fairness um, in that context as well, where there's a possibility that you know there's a development of a technology here um, that ultimately may not reach every affected person here, but there's now also a focus happening elsewhere. Is there, I'm not sure if I'm phrasing this right, but what is that balance of fairness of focusing on people here and focusing on people elsewhere and making sure that all can can benefit from the technology while not overlooking people in our own Yeah, yeah. State? So I, you know, I think that it's really important um, that in high resource countries that we get this right first at one level. I, I think, you know, if you take Europe and Canada and the United States, um, I don't know, you have over a million people with sickle cell disease. Um, if we can design and develop this to work in those countries and integrate that into Sub-Saharan Africa and India, I think that makes sense. At the same time that we do the basic science research to make this just so much easier to access in all of the parts of the world so that we are not losing sight that the burden is not here. And so we're doing the science to actually bring this to Sierra Leone um, at the same time that we're making it work in Oakland, California. Uh, and so, I, you know, I feel very, very confident that we have to see if we can make this work in the United States and, and in a way that um, people can access this as a treatment, that need this treatment, that we can make the decisions of who's most appropriate for this treatment, um, and then we can figure out how to pay for it. And so, you know, I do think we need to think about that. One of the things I'm really interested in also that I didn't talk about today is thinking about high income countries in, and to do some comparative analysis because our health care system is so different from the UK and France uh, and Canada. And how do we do this in these different kinds of health care systems? And what can we learn from these other countries that can help us here in the United States? So, so I think that there's a lot with regards to collaboration uh, in these countries that have the ability to do this type of treatment today uh, in, in an experimental way to help us both uh, integrate this into our clinical care, but then think about uh, low resource countries. All right, so with that, let's uh, see if there's food available and let's get started. All right. Thanks.